rather than give an individual impression of each E3 press conference, I'm just going to give an overall impression of the day. Importantly, bear in mind that I will be ignoring several games and features because either they are no interest to me, or simply I don't hold much of an opinion on them. Considering the amount of pressure that Microsoft was under, I think it's fitting that we give more focus to them. Not for any pity, rather than simply because I wanted to see how they would fight back. Microsoft had their best press conference in a long time, and arguably this was probably one of the strongest showings of the day. They wasted no time getting straight to what gamers want, and I applaud them for doing so. Opening with Metal Gear Solid 5 rather than Call of Duty was a smart move because the ability to bring a competitor's exclusive to another system really shows strong business agendas. With the loss of Bungie comes the gain of Konami. One of Xbox One's exclusive launch titles, Rise, looked cinematically impressive and genuinely seemed like a great concept. However, while this does seem like an exciting game, the vast amount of quick time events completely weighed down my eagerness to play it because it simply looked like it could get dull pretty fast. Now while of no interest to me because of its genre, I do love that Microsoft is going back to their nostalgic roots with Killer Instinct. It seems to be a highlight for most people and I can truly see why, but I personally have no interest seeing as I have a history of getting overly frustrated with fighting games, but it was great to see these kind of games nonetheless. Titanfall was the game that was supposed to show what former Call of Duty developers Jason West and Vince Sempella were up to, and I'm happy to say that I'm glad it's not another traditional military shooter. Titanfall's mecha FPS style did grab my attention, especially with the ability to leave the machines and go on foot. It felt very much like the free-to-play PC game Hawken. My two personal highlights were Project Spark and Dead Rising 3. Now, pardon the pun, but Project Spark didn't exactly spark any intrigue for me at first, but after watching how the developers used the tablet device to create a world, it really showed where gaming devices could potentially go. Yet, both Microsoft and Ubisoft need to take note. Please stop using scripts to convey your game. It's terribly cringeworthy. I can morph the landscape, so I'll cover you from up here. You know, I think I'm going to need some more help to take these guys on. All right, hang tight. This fireball will carve out a huge lava pit. Boom! That'll slow him down. While a zombie craze is definitely becoming fatiguing, I have a personal love for Dead Rising. For me, the original Dead Rising was the reason I bought the Xbox 360. While not the greatest game in the world, Dead Rising was the first to allow players to live out the fantasy of brutally executing thousands of zombies. Interestingly, Dead Rising 3 is taking a much more serious tone with its dark and gritty setting. Yes, the game does have its absurd weapon creation and zombie mutilations, but when combined with the new visual style, it seems like tonal inconsistencies are bound to occur. Yet, it was great to see it in action and I am pleasantly surprised at its intensity and feeling of entrapment. The major reaction I'll take away from Microsoft's press conference was just how spectacular the visuals were. We are finally seeing that graphical leap, just not in the actual gameplay. On a final note, the changes to Xbox Live were overdue and I appreciated what they were doing, despite it being completely desperate and awkwardly embarrassing in trying to keep their subscriptions up. Now for EA. Uh... Mare's Edge was cool, I guess. Let's move on. Ubisoft. To be honest, this was probably the most disappointing conference because I genuinely have a lot of faith in Ubisoft for their diverse range of games. The problem was, it just seemed like they were showing what games they have coming out this fall rather than actually showing them in action. Splinter Cell, Assassin's Creed 4 and Watch Dogs were expected and their content reveal was pretty obvious. I'm happy that South Park is still in the works and the trailer showed it still looks like a South Park game. It's called the Nagasaki because if you do it right it makes people go Ooh. The crew bored the bollocks off me and when I was watching it all I could think was Screw you guys, I'm going home. But Carmen, we're trying to- uh, Screw you guys, home. What was probably my biggest surprise, again coming from Ubisoft after last year's Watch Dogs reveal, was Tom Clancy's The Division. 
It took me a while to really digest whether it was going to be just a tactical shooter or an RPG, but as the demo went along, it came to surprise me as to what this game actually holds. The RPG elements, the visual style, the impressive tactical based shooting, this all blends to create what could be an innovation in online shooters. Finally, Sony wasn't really that impressive bar one really major aspect. There wasn't any exclusives that grabbed my attention and made me excited, but I will say one thing. Sony trolled Microsoft. Won't impose any new restrictions on the use of PS4 games. This has got to be one of the greatest video game moments ever. This is how you share your games on PS4. Thanks. PlayStation. Sony supports used games, there is no online requirement, and their console is exceedingly cheap at $399 or £349. Not exceedingly cheap, but cheaper than Xbox One. These tiny features go a long way in determining long-term investment in a next-gen console. As I say all the time, it's always about the games, but what Sony did changes everything. Microsoft has restricted their games while Sony has opened theirs to accessibility. Xbox One games are less appealing when taking into account the burden of the hardware. Sony's support for used games and no online creates an obvious distinction. In the current gen, differences were very minimal to the overall product. Games played the exact same way and the online market was largely similar in exclusive content. Now we're seeing one console with an unnecessary burden of always online connection and the inability to trade in used games or share them with your friends, and another console that continues the flow of being able to share and trade and play games without ever being shut off when your internet goes down. <sighs> and relax. Xbox One will still sell well considering it's no longer a games console by definition and instead a multi-purpose entertainment system which creates a broader market. Xbox One's new features are very much innocuous because it's ultimately a different product, but to say it's for gamers is sadly mistaken. There are plenty of hardcore gamers that will support and defend Microsoft which is completely understandable because they have pride and you can't take that away from them. For me, Sony's PlayStation 4 is designed for the gamer and doesn't attempt to be what it's not. From what it seems, Microsoft does have some great games to show, but it's hampered by Xbox One's ridiculous features. Sony didn't show exclusives that really convinced me either, but their more manageable, affordable and comforting console features put them ahead of Microsoft. In short, it pretty much felt like this. Sony said, screw you Microsoft, and Microsoft said, screw you gamers. Sorry. <laughs>